Gandhi's philosophy of non-violence included Satyagraha, I hope I've got that right, the removal of tyranny through civil disobedience, and the Sadeshi, the economic boycott of foreign goods. At the same time, he lived by his ideals and ethics and devoted himself to a higher purpose, Satya, the search for truth. Mohandas Gandhi did not invent the concept of pacism, non-cooperation, non-violence and peaceful resistance solely as a weapon to achieve political outcomes. He certainly personified and applied such concepts to an extraordinary level to himself and for the freedom of India. But what of our experiences with oppression and tyranny in Australia? The Vinegar Hill Rebellion in 1804, the uprisings in the Victorian gold fields in the 1850s, which led to the Eureka Stockade, even Ned Kelly's attempt to set up the Republic of Northeastern Victoria, all failed because the main avenue chosen was an unequal violence confrontation between government and the oppressed. It is notable that in the most successful challenges of, to oppression and injustice by Aboriginal people in Northern Australia, the Pilbara strikes in 1946 and the Gurindji people's walk-off from the servitude of the Vesti properties in 1966 had parallels with the non-violent resistance used by Gandhi. In both instances, the strategies used so effectively by Gandhi, the removal of labour, boycott of economic activities and non-violent opposition were used by leaders to resist attempts by those with power and money to force Aboriginal people back into the cages of oppression and slavery. Vincent Lingiari succeeded with his walk-off where the Bonaba resistance leader, Jandamara, could not with his guerrilla warfare. The spirit of resistance that Jandamara stands for today still burns bright. But in the, in the stand of the Gurindji, we see how the armory of resistance was adjusted to include non-violent forms of protest. There are other examples where Aboriginal people have resisted attempts by the state and others to trample their rights without resorting to violence and the use of brute force. Nookenbar and the Kimberley and the Tent Embassy in Canberra springs to mind. The recent events in Canberra may have tainted this perception of the Tent Embassy for some. It would be simplistic, however, to condemn outright the behaviour of protesters associated with the Tent Embassy last week, without considering the sense of oppression that some of our people still feel towards our governments on a whole range of matters. I will always condemn bad manners and unnecessarily aggressive behaviour by whomever, but I will also defend people's rights to assert their political position and try to look at the heart of why people feel so oppressed that they feel violent confrontation is the only recourse to the resolution of their position. As a nation state, we have not succeeded in achieving a just accommodation of the truth concerning the sovereign Indigenous peoples who occupied this continent prior to the arrival of the British. While it may be convenient for some to want to forget this point, it, is nevertheless, it nevertheless remains that the Australian nation that came into being in 1901 was founded on a historical legacy of colonial dispossession and silence about the presence of Indigenous people. As a nation, we may have the possibility, should we go to a referendum, to address this by recognising the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in the Constitution of Australia. But even now, in the second decade of the 21st century, full and proper recognition of the status of the Indigenous peoples as the first peoples, with rights and responsibilities that go with that status, is regarded with alarm by some within our country. This is despite the fact that countries like Canada, New Zealand, 
Norway, demonstrating that it is possible to agree and give substantive recognition to Indigenous peoples without that recognition leading to the downfall of the nation state. Indigenous Australia has never been recognised as equal people in their own lands. Australian courts have generally ruled that we are subject to the jurisdiction of the settler state. Our own customary laws, which have sustained our societies for millennia, have been set aside and discarded as worthless. The wealth of the nation state of Australia enjoys what it enjoys comes from the exploitation of our lands and waters. The price of this has been our dispossession and displacement and our dependent relationship with the nation state. Australia is one of the wealthiest nations of the world, yet we seem incapable of lifting the vast majority of Indigenous people in this country to anywhere near parity on any social indicator with non-Indigenous Australians. In the midst of the mining boom, many Aboriginal people are finding immediate relief from the poverty besetting many of our communities by gaining employment in the mining industry. But I question whether in the long term our participation in unbridled exploitation is not in fact adding to the diminishment of our custodial responsibilities to humanity, global sustainability and resilience. <clears throat> 